Chapter 39, This Coming Storm We all gotta go sometime. I was just hoping for something more heroic. Souls Souls are the spirit and essence of a pony. The fundamental core of their nature and the kernel of life that exists beyond the biology of flesh and blood and mental synapses. I had been I've seen empirical evidence of the reality of souls. Beyond that, my beliefs in the afterlife, where the souls of dead ponies continued on in eternal peace and in a transcendent souls of Celestia Luna as goddesses who watched over us with love and pity and hope. These surpassed the foundations of knowledge and were the architecture of faith. But the two things I did know Souls had a living power, and a soul was a hard thing to kill. There was no way I could know for sure if the black book had been destroyed. But if it was not, then it was either buried under rubble or fused into a crater of glass. The black book hadn't needed to be the conduit of some eldritch comic cosmic horror, or its pages filled with blasphemous magic, to corrupt those close to it. It was enough that the book was the host to a wicked and twisted soul, the soul of an insane, malsificent zebra. The black book called out to those around it, who were susceptible to its influence. Two alicorns had walked into the throne room. One sensed the presence of the black book. The other did not. Calamity had not reacted to it when I had found it. My other friends had been near it as we traveled with me. But it had sunk barbed hooks into my mind even before I had retrieved it. We would encounter two alicorns that had been affected by the temptations of the black book without ever, ever having opened it or seen it. Nightseer had been transformed by the book's proximity. She had been one of those who the goddess had sent to find the book. Did her telepathy leave her especially defenseless? Had the black book filled the void in her mind left by the absence of the goddess? I was vulnerable to it. My weakness, addiction, curiosity, and the shame of having only a single spell played to its strengths. The soul of the black book had been particularly ancient and powerful. I had possessed the black book for less than two days, and it had already begun to tempt me. Clumsily, perhaps at first, the book wasn't telepathic like the goddess. Most of the horrors in my nightmare I had provided for myself. The book merely used the tools my fevered night terrors gave it. And still, I did not have the strength alone to withstand its first probing attacks. To be able to stand against that influence as it continuously tried to elope you away, to hold to any part of yourself after years with the book, much less to take its twisted gifts and create something noble and good for them. That would take a level of moral endurance and fortitude almost beyond comprehension, be unwavering. How often had those six ponies from the past, through the radiance of their souls, given me insights that I couldn't have had by myself, or allowed me to tap reserves of strength and will that I shouldn't have been able to muster. They had saved me and guided me since finding Applejack in Old Appaloosa, their influence growing with each statuette I found. But it was only after I had brought them all together that they had been able to intervene on my behalf more directly. I believe it was no coincidence that rarity was the first to appear. My mind and soul had ever so briefly become the battleground for two warring influences. One powerful soul of evil and madness against six shards that shone with the virtue and hope of Rarity and her five closest friends. The shards of the statuettes were not truly those of the Ministry Mares. I suppose they were more like Rarity's soul wearing perfect disguises, but they shone with the true nature of those other ponies. They burned with the love and compassion and virtue and nobility of each of the Ministry Mares in turn. 
they were eternal. Metaphysical images of the deepest, truest nat nature of those ponies, lit up like beacons, fueled by a shining piece of rarity herself. Rarity, whose magical talent had always been in the shadow of Twilight Sparkle, must have seemed like easy prey to the zebra soul within the book. It had been wrong. She was one of the bearers of the elements of harmony for a reason. And when the soul images of the Ministry Mares were brought together, they brought the inner flame that fuels the elements of harmony with them. They had proven more powerful, even as mere shards, than the whole soul residing in the book, or, at least, powerful enough to give me the strength I needed to fend it off. If the Black Book could not stand against the gestalt of the Ministry Mares' souls, then they, when they were only shards, how could it have worked against the soul of Twilight Sparkle, combined in unity with three of the most magically powerful mares of her time? The Black Book was not telepathic, but it could sense souls around it, knowing instinctively whom it could manipulate, and whom it could not. The last temptation of the book had an air of desperation about it. The zebra soul had no way of knowing I was about to destroy its soul jar. It had been reacting to something else. The Black Book had sensed the goddess, and it had been afraid. What happens to a soul when it is no longer has a body to hold it? Does it truly transcend? Does it spread out, or no longer be contained? Like the hydrogen in a balloon that has been popped, until it is no longer truly a soul, indistinguishable from the environment. What of the souls trapped together in the horror that was the goddess? My goal has been to destroy the physical reality of the goddess and free the souls trapped inside, to allow Twilight Sparkle, Trixie, and the others the rest they deserved and had been denied. I had not expected the goddess to try and save her children, but I had not expected the impact of the six memory orbs either. By showing these memories to the goddess, I had awoken something in Trixie. The goddess had become lost, and I believe part of her was able to find herself in those memories. The star orb had been created for comparison. By showing that memory to the goddess, I had acted like Rarity's mirror had for Pinkie Pie, just like I had hoped the memories of the balloon orb might stir whatever still remained of Twilight Sparkle. And what about my own soul? If I died here, would Celestia and Luna welcome me, or turn me away in horror and disgust? I knew what I had done, and my soul was blackened from it. I had finally taken the step off the cliff. I had sacrificed my own morality and goodness to save the Equestrian Wasteland. I was red-eye now, through and through, and there would be a price to pay for that. Thirty-eight minutes would have been plenty of time, but that time was never meant for me. It was time enough for Zenith and Calamity to escape. I had been willing to forfeit my own life. Thirty-eight minutes would have been enough for the alicorns of the goddess to have scoured Maripony, found the bomb, and disarmed whatever timer Red Eye had constructed for it. But the Balefire bomb had never been in Maripony. Thirty-eight minutes was not long enough for the alicorns to have fought their way through the maze of Hellhound Warrens and found the bomb hidden dozens of yards beneath Maripony's foundation. The Balefire Bomb had gone off in a subterranean detonation directly beneath us. I awoke in pitch, dar pitch darkness. I felt sick, even worse than in the days past. My body was hot. My mouth was dry. My stomach was twisted painfully, and there was nothing in it to heave. My body was covered in sweat. There was a crushing weight on my lower body, the brabrack memories of a nightmare, being trapped under a wall, crawling, crying out while I watched Calamity and Velvet Remedy walk away. There was a hiss from the darkness below. The floor beneath me slanted. I would have slid down into the hissing blackness, but I was pinned. My pit buck was slowly clicking. For a few terrifying minutes, I had no idea where I was. Then, 
I remembered the bomb. Remembering running to the safe room. Bucking, the emergency button. I didn't recall a whole lot after that. My memories were a jumble. But I did remember feeling the almighty thwomp from somewhere underneath us. The feeling of the whole room being thrust upwards as the bomb annihilated everything above it. A brief moment of weightlessness and the rush of falling. Click. Click. I turned on my eyes forward sparkle, wondering when I had turned it off. A dozen warnings flashed across the screen. The safe room had survived two mega spells. One almost point blank. But there was a micro fracture somewhere in its protective walls, and radiation was leaking in. Considering how hot it must be outside, the fact that I was still alive in the room wasn't an unbearable oven spoke praise of Twilight and her ministry. But I was swiftly reaching fatal levels of exposure. I floated a rat away from my saddlebags, bracing myself against the horrid taste. According to my inventory sorter, the other medical supplies I had packed, including several healing potions and a vial of Zenith's bleeding stopper goo, were all gone. I had been conscious before, but I had no recollection of it. The magic of the safe room must have prevented me from being turned into paste by the concussive force of the blast alone. Even still, with the fall I must have taken, I was lucky I didn't break my neck, or anything else. According to my EFS, I was remarkably unbattered for a mare who was dying. Wait, hadn't there been some pony else in here with me? Peering into the darkness, I tried to remember. My EFS company compass was telling me I was alone. I lifted my pip leg and turned on the light. Oh, merciful goddesses! My pipbook light shone down a room, tilted at an insane angle. The terminal blank or bank had torn off the wall. The concrete of the ceiling had collapsed in, revealing the shiny purple tainted metal above it. A large slab of the concrete lay across me, pinning me in place. Below, the lower third of the room was filled with discolored water, rubble, and the mangled filing cabinet. A small spray was coming from a section in the wall which had been torn open. Something floated in the dark pool beneath me. It was a more spacious coffin than the healing booth. But I had been foolish to think this room would save me. I was trapped, locked inside, and even if I could escape, outside was certain death. I'm out of food, and the safe room water talisman seems to have been corrupted. Twilight said. At least, I'm fairly confident that pure water isn't supposed to be that color. The water talisman was tainted. My body of what had once been... Of the body of what had once been Ambrosa was beneath that water. Mostly. Her body had bulged and metastable... Metast... Whatever. Under the taint. And strained against the armor. The blob of malformed flesh had pushed out through the open visor like a tongue. A fleshy, grotesque, misshapen worm floated on the surface of the water. I screamed as I realized it was one of my own hind legs. After several long minutes of terror, I realized I could feel both my hind legs. Barely able to breathe, I shifted my light, trying to look under the slab that was crushing me. Both my hind legs were there, intact, and healthy, except one was the pink of exposed skin, with only a light fuzz of a coat. I had lost my leg in the fall, and I had regrown it. I didn't think it was possible to feel even sicker, but I did. A deep soul-aching horror filled me as I realized that I wasn't even a pony anymore, I was something else. I wanted to cry, to scream. Was I a ghoul, transformed by the bomb? Or was this something from my exposure to the taint? How far removed was I now from being one of the goddess's children? At least the radiation would kill me before the room filled with enough to, for me to drown. 
unless I was enough of a pseudo alicorn that the radiation wouldn't kill me. I prayed that was it. Please. Please. Celestia, I beg you. Have mercy on me. I turned off my light. It was better not seeing. Something wretched the safe room. The concrete slab scraped against me as it shifted, drawing blood. The wounds were already closing as I tried to brace myself, worried that the slab might slide off. Then I felt the whole room lift, soaring into the air. The tainted water washed over me as the room righted itself. The misshapen flesh bob that had once been my leg washed up against me. I screamed in horror at the slimy touch of my desecrated former flesh. A violent grinding filled the air, and the metal shutters over the windows pulled away, revealing a purple tainted sky of clouds filled with billowing ash. The armored glass shattered, the razor sharp shards hovering then whisking away. My pit buck began to click rapidly. Somewhere above, I spotted the dark silhouette of a wagon and a glowing light of green and gold. For a moment, I thought it was pyrolite, but then I realized the glow was coming from a pegasus. Had my friends come to rescue me? How? And at what cost? Oh, calamity, I thought, weeping without tears. What have you done? But something was wrong. A purple glow enveloped me, a second floating the slab off my leg. I was levitated out of the obliterated window. The super alicorn, her coat a dark purple to the point of black, stared at me with glowing eyes as she casually tossed away the safe room, performing telekinesis that would have overstrained me with effortless ease. The clouds above seemed awfully close. I glanced downwards. We were very, very high. Below, the second crater of Splendid Valley glowed in aftermath. With a beat of her wings, she flew up level with the wagon above us, bringing me with her. I realized at once that the wagon was not the Sky Bandit, and the glowing Pegasus was not Calamity. Did he do? The super irradiated ghoul grinned happily at me, a sickly green, a golden green light emanating from her mouth and around her teeth. The creatures of radiation do not merely heal in its presence. If they absorb enough of it, they grow stronger, more powerful. Ditsy Do had come into Splendid Valley looking for me. She had saved me. She and... The Super Alicorn set me on the front bench of Absolutely Everything Delivery Wagon, right behind Ditsy Do. Without the glow of her magic, the purple tint vanished from the sky, traded for a sickly green. My pit bucks clicking went insane. We were high enough above the crater that the radiation levels were uh, t to be merely bad. But Ditsy Do was shedding enough radiation to make this a very short rescue. The glowing ghoul smiled and pointed back at the wagon. I turned around looking in through a small window. Inside the wagon were crates of Rataway, the packets glowing in inviting orange. I quickly levitated several and began to drink, turning back to thank her. I stopped as my eyes caught the cutie mark of the super alicorn's flank. A large pink star surrounded by smaller white ones. The super alicorn was silent impassive. Her gaze seemed fixed on my saddlebags. I was struck by a flash of insight. The goddess had sent her children away, but she was telepathic, maintaining contact with them. When her body was destroyed, and the souls of the countless ponies who had been consumed into her were set free, some of them, the strongest ones, found their way into the bodies of her fleeing children possession. But those bodies were already taken by souls of their own. It was unlikely that this could last. Already, the cutie mark on the super alicorn was beginning to fade. I scrambled. If this twilight sparkle, in any way, there was something she needed to hear. 
I turned up the volume on my ear bloom and levitated it towards her as, she found, as I found the file. And the voice of Pinkie Pie, tinny and assorted, crackled through the air. Hi, Twilight. It's me. I mean, I have you with me now, so you'll kind of be with me anyway. But it's not the same. I want the real Twilight Sparkle. I want my friend back. Please? I'll do anything. The super alicorn had hovered, seeming transfixed by the sound, until the message was gone. Then, wordlessly, she turned and began to fly away. The cutie mark on her flank was almost completely gone. Twilight, wait! I cried after the disappearing alicorn. Star Sparkle is still alive, and Spike! But whatever part of Twilight Sparkle my words might once have been able to reach were gone now. Evaporated. Or, if my heart could hope, just asleep. I wanted to cry, but my body wouldn't produce tears. I drank another of those horrid rataways as Ditsy Doo turned and began flying us out of Splendid Valley. Ditsy Doo brought the wagon low as we reached the edge of the valley. We began flying along the border, moving more slowly. We were searching for something. I wanted to ask what, but Ditsy Doo couldn't speak. What did you do? What did you just do? The voice of Ambrosa fluttered through my mind. I fought to remember. I told her about the bomb. I was sure about that. I couldn't recall exactly what I'd said, but an antsy mare with a magical energy battle saddle didn't exactly engender a desire to lie. Her response had been to try and call Harbringer through the broadcaster built into her helmet. This room is designed to stop mega spells. I recalled telling her. Your radio isn't going to penetrate. She had looked at me with panic. I have to tell Harbringer. He has to get out of here. We have to pull back. Her words had sparked a burst of fear in my breast. How many ponies do you have outside? The ground passed slowly beneath me. I couldn't remember any more. I caught them on my eyes forward sparkle, friendly lights appearing on my EFS compass before I actually spotted my friends. As we approached a clearing not far from the devastated red-eye camp, Steelers appeared, pulling camouflage netting off the Sky Bandit. Velvet Remedy, Zenith, and Calamity emerged from within. They looked worn, weary, and bed-ragged. Calamity immediately took the air, while Velvet and Zenith scanned the skies. Pyrelight was missing from the group. Where was Pyrelight? Did you find anything this time? My Pegasus friend shouted. I tried to jump up, but my body just didn't have the energy. So instead, I waved. He couldn't see me anyway. Ditsy Doo was too bright. Ditsy Doo flew us in closer, pulling up and hovering at the edge of the clearing. I downed yet another rataway as she waved Calamity back. I felt weak, sick, half dead. My body was alien to me now. I wasn't me anymore. But all of that paled in comparison to the wash of joy at the impending reunion. I needed to get to Ten Pony Tower, get clean to the taint I had suffered, assess what was left for me, of me, and, if Helmut would still have me, spend a forever with her and my friends. A short forever, unfortunately. I had cleared the way for Red Eye to ascend, and he had a host of unicorns he planned to sacrifice in the process. With the threats of the goddess and the black book taken care of, I now had a new quest before me. To brave the Everfree Forest and rescue those unicorns from Red Eye's cathedral. I probably didn't have a lot of time, now that Red Eye couldn't count on alicorns for protection anymore. He would likely act fast. But I was in no shape to fight a rad roach, much less infiltrate a stronghold. My body was weeping for me to give it care and rest. I couldn't push it further until I had done so. Hey, it's Little Pip! Clamity shouted ecstatically. Hey, every pony! Ditsy's brought back Little Pip! She's alive! Velvet Remedy and Zenith began to stomp in applause. Velvet gave out a shoutful thanks. 
Stew has whined. Thank Applejack. He turned to the others. Okay, let's get out of here. I don't like being in one place too long. Especially it is close to... The ground erupted. Fountains of dirt burst into the air, as half a dozen hellhounds tore themselves out of the ground. Dutsy Doo pulled up as one of them swung her magical energy rifle around and fired at us. Velvet Raymond let out a scream. Calamity spun in the air, kicking a lever on his battle saddle, switching ammo. One of the hellhounds closed on Zenith, taking a swipe. The zebra ducked, turning and bucking the hellhound in the chest, dropping her. Stulus began to fire, his grenade machine gun tearing apart one of the hellhounds as she aimed a multi-gem magical shotgun towards Velvet and Zenith. Get to the wagon, Clamid shouted as he took a shot, staggering a hellhound who was trying to climb out of the sky bandit. The earth beneath steel hooves blasted upwards as a hellhound lashed out of the ground. The hellhound's claw slashed in a long arc, slicing through steel hooves armor. Steel hooves armored body fell to the broken ground with a heavy thud. His armored head rolled a few yards away. The world stopped. The battle still raged, but it was some place far away. All the color and sound seemed to mute, leaving just me, the beating of my heart, and the slow rocking of Steelhoof's head. Steelhoof's was dead. A cold, wet chill ran down my body. There was no coming back from that. I'd seen Zenith decapitate a canterlot zebra. But the little pony in my head was shaking in denial. No. No, she insisted. There will still be an ugly warping sound, and he'll get right back up with us. Just like always. Stilos was dead. I couldn't move. Couldn't feel. Couldn't breathe. My mind was locked up. The gears jammed. The hellhounds weren't going to give me a moment to process, much less to grieve. The hellhound who killed Steelhooves stepped forward, skewered his claws through Steelhooves' helmet, then spun and hurled the armored head at one of my companions, trying to knock us out of the sky. Ditsy Doo dodged, and Steelhooves' head slammed against her wagon next to me, splintering the wood. The input and impact cracked the, his helmet's headlamp. Something snapped inside of me. My horn burst with light, layer upon layer of overglow, brighter than even Ditsy Doo. The hellhounds were surrounded with light as they shot upwards into the sky, all of them, higher and higher, until they were nothing but black specks. They weren't visible at all. Steel hooves! Velvet screamed dashing to the fallen, headless body, and wrapping it in her forelegs. All the others turned, eyes wide, as they realized we had lost one of our own. Thud. The ground shook as the first hellhound fell out of the sky. The mangled, broken body oozed. Thud! 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 You even know what Balefire is? Another flash of memory tugged at me as we approached New Appaloosa. We were flying now, moving quickly. Zenith stood on the Sky Bandit, watching the clouds. I got the impression we would be walking, but my condition was too severe for me to even try the journey. I ain't safe to fly no more, Clementy called out to me, flying as close as he could to the Absolutely Everything wagon without suffering Ditsy's exposure. Damn Enclave have patrols everywhere. And ain't airborne. Anything ain't <clears throat> and anything airborne tends to catch their attention. Not even the sky bandit is exactly low profile, considering our clouds breached last month. We just couldn't catch a break. You sure it was Harbringer that you saw a Maripony? That's who he said he was, I called back, hating how much effort that took to shout. Damn. I figured this had to be big when a whole regiment of the Enclave descended on Maripony. Zenith and I barely made it out of there. But we blew up a member of the Enclave Hoff Council? I could use one of your creative swears about now, little pip. Clamity frowned. Congratulations. 
We just declared war on the Enclave. Ouch. But even as I grimaced, I realized that the Enclave had shown up, knowing that Red Eye was plotting against the Goddess. If anything, they would suspect he had been behind the bomb, and I was his agent. Which, on a very real level, was absolutely accurate. From the Enclave's perspective, Red Eye had just declared war. I could see Pyrolite circling above the city, a single bird of prey. She let out a hoot as the two wagons landed, Ditsy Doo setting down a little distance from the sky wagon. Pyrolite dove out of the air, disappearing into the town. Maybe he got out, I offered weakly. Not much chance of that, Clemity called back. The moment the alicorns were clear, the huge alicorn shield wrapped round all the Maripony. I reckon she was trying to trap you inside with her. No pony got out. Or she was trying to contain the blast, protect her free fleeing children. With a shield that powerful, generated by the goddess herself, the only thing that would get out of her, all through it, was her telepathy, until the second the bomb killed her. That was, assuming she didn't realize that the bomb wasn't within her shield. In truth, the Bellfire bomb was planted far enough beneath the facility that it could very well have been outside her shield. And if she suspected that, maybe she was trying to save herself. Either way, it didn't matter. The mega spell augmented Balefire had proven greater than the goddess's power. It's magical fire, I had offered, answering Ambrosa, even as I realized I didn't really know what Balefire was, other than green and radioactive. It's bottled, necromancy-enhanced dragon's breath, Ambrosa told me. The magical, disintegrative type of dragon's breath that can send you someplace else. In the case of Balefire, probably straight to hell. Based on the possession of the super alicorn, who I had presumed, uh, who had possibly been a normal alicorn until Twilight Sparkle, flew around New Crater in Splendid Valley, searching for survivors. Ambrosa's guest was almost certainly wrong, but the concept was still chilling. Something Rarity had said struck me. I even tried to have Spike burn it, and all that did was send it to Princess Celestia. I remember thinking of Spike roasting an enclave pony inside of her armor. It was horrid and sickening to witness, but I felt a little better about it if I could imagine he was sending her straight forward to Celestia which led to the hurting reality of the body being carried inside the Sky Bandit. Should we have, have Steel Hooves cremated? Would Spike be willing? We can't stay here, Calamity said, a normal cheer gone from his voice. He looked at Ditsy Doo. And none of us. Ditsy Doo nodded, sadly. She dropped one of her chalkboards and wrote on it. Is this permanent? Nah. I reckon it should just bleed off, just like when Pyrolite soaked in the Philadelphia crater, Calamity assured her. But Pyrolite took days to return to normal, Velvet Remedy reminded them. Her eyes were still wet and puffy with tears. She had been riding with Steel Who's body and head, watching over him. And Ditsy Doo was taken in far more radiation than Pyrolite did. It could be weeks. The sweet ghoul mare looked panicked. She quickly erased her chalkboard and wrote, Silver Bell in large letters. Velvet nodded, smiling sadly. I'll stay here and watch over her. You can't, I said, speaking up finally. We're not allowed inside town. Zenith looked, in looked up with surprise. We are not? She asked, her exotic voice betraying her own depression. When did we offend this town? Before your time, Calamity said. Back when it was just Lil Pip, Velvet, and me. Well, then I am not barred, it would seem, Zenith asserted, turning to Ditsy Doo. She too smiled gently. It would be a pleasure to watch Silverbell for you while you were away. Ditsy Doo forgot herself, swooping up to the zebra and giving Zenith a tight, albeit squishy, hug. Zenith stiffened, but bit back any response. The ghoul swiftly swiftly backed away, writing, sorry, on her chalkboard. Hey, look, 
Ditsy, Clamity offered. I might know where y'all can get some help. There's a mayor up in Friendship City who's been researching radiation and its effects on creatures. If anybody can help you shed off this quicker, it'd be her. Ditsy smiled brightly, one of her eyes rolling upwards as she visibly fought her urge to hug Calamity now. Why don't you travel with us for a spell? Calamity offered. Ain't safe to travel alone, and we're heading that way, ain't we, little pill? Ten Pony Tower. I nodded, realizing we couldn't cremate Tilu's body. He wasn't ours. Fetlock first. We have to take Steelhoos back to Stable 29. The massive gate of New Appaloosa rumbled open. The Griffin bodyguard, whom I had seen with Ditsy Doo before, flew out. Silverbell scampered after him. Her eyes went wide when she saw Ditsy Doo. Mommy, you look like Pyrelite! The Lavender Filly began to charge across the road between us, reaching, uh, trying to reach her. Xena swiftly caught her, holding her back. Mommy! I heard a struggling sound. I wasn't sure if it was some velvet or Ditsy Doo. A glowing Pegasus rubbed her hoof against her chalkboard, erasing Silverbell's name, and rose something else before quickly picking the chalkboard up again. Silverbell struggled against the restraining legs of Zenith and began to cry. Ditsy Doo trotted halfway to where Zenith was holding Silverbell, as close as she dared to get and set the chalkboard down on the street. Stay away, love. Mommy's poison. The clouds began to darken, threatening the equestrian wasteland with another storm. Dark shadows moved just behind the surface of the clouds. As we watched, the shadows took the shape of great black warships descending beneath the cloud curtain. Each warship was a huge development, a deployment hangar, and platforms for massive energy weapons, flanked by blackest thunderclouds and moving through the air on a dozen propellers. Through my binoculars, I could barely make out the swarms of black dots that were armored pegasi flying in formations between the warships. Raptors, Calamity announced grimly, watching as the warships descended lower altering course slightly. Dragon killers. I allowed my magic to expire. I dropped my binoculars to the ground next to me. I was a loss for an appropriately colorful metaphor. Anything involving Luna's horn now struck me as grievously inappropriate. My gaze found Ditsy Doo, the brightest point of light. She was enwrapped with a lead-lined cloak, something she had the griffin fetch from her shop. An old mailbag hang from her side, but her hooves, face, and wings still burned like an emerald furnace. I recalled something Homage had said as DJ Pwn3, claiming a mail pony had delivered a letter from Ditsy Doo. Beneath the anti-radiation barding Ditsy Doo had provided me, and my own barding underneath, my own coat was growing back over my hind leg my new hind leg. Just thinking about that felt deeply wrong. I'd been drinking enough Rataway to purge most of the radiation from my system, even traveling in the back of absolutely everything delivery wagon. But I still felt weak and twisted up inside. We were just a hill back from Trixie's cottage. In theory, we had stopped for lunch, but no pony was eating. I couldn't stomach anything. Ditsy Doo didn't have to eat, and neither Velvet nor Calamity had any appetite. They both just stared at their cans of beans until Ditsy Doo trotted up, dropping her chalkboard, which said, Your poor beans are getting all lonely. They want to be with your want to be with their friends in their stomach in your stomach. And Calamity then chuckled and nibbled a little at that. Velvet Remedy had just given a sad smile. I drank another rat away. They've been coming down out of the sky like that for the last two days, Clamity informed me. Ponies are freaking out, going into hiding. The whole damn wasteland feels like it's under martial law. He looked askance at me. They took over the broadcasts this morning, 
both Red Eye and DJ Poem 3. Radio's now all enclave, all the time. I put on my ear bloom and turned on my Pitbox radio, trying to ignore the squirming feeling of my insides. Instead of Homage's music or DJ Poem 3's voice, I caught the end of a Pegasus anthem. Greetings, ponies of Equestria. By now, you have seen our ships in the sky overhead. Perhaps our Pegasi have even landed in your streets. But there is no need for alarm. Our scouts are merely assessing the current situation before we determine how we can best help you. I switched it off. I'd heard enough or better propaganda from Red Eye. I'm trying to fig I try not to doubt myself here, Clemmy admitted. I left because I realized the Enclave might, uh, never intended to rejoin the rest of Equestria. The Enclave wasn't even interested in helping down here. Now, I'm guessing a lot of things. They tried to make a deal with the Goddess, I told him. They aren't here to help. Yeah, Clement said dourly. I didn't really figure they were. This is just a backup plan. Clamity started packing up the camouflage netting again. Where did you get that? I asked. Steel ooze, Clamity sighed. When the Enclave first appeared, he procured this from Crossroads. Said we needed to keep the Sky Bandit covered with this when we weren't moving. I swallowed. I started to think of all the time Steel Hooves had protected us, but ended up just thinking about his voice. That deep, masculine rumble, like Flutter Guy's voice, Watcher had claimed, and now I'd never hear it from him again. My burning eyes wanted to cry. He was real good at that, Clement said solemnly, thinking tactically. We shared a moment of silence. Minutes later, we were flying again. We had been trying to keep low, but the train was about to make that difficult. Clement winged us upwards, gaining altitude as we passed over the ruins of Trixie's cottage. There were several alicorns standing around it. They didn't pay us more attention than a fleeing glance. If anything, I would have said they looked lost. Tomorrow, Crossroads told us. I blinked with surprise. We were in the security center of Stable 29. A somber air hung over the entire stable. Sheila's body had been taken into the Crusader mainframe room by an honor guard. Tomorrow? I asked, swaying slightly. My body felt so weak. My hooves wanted to rest. My mind was fogged, but there was a fairly sure... But I was fairly sure that the new acting elder's announcement was abnormal. Isn't that awfully fast? Star Pallet and Crossroads made. Every Steel Ranger outcast who would be able to make it is already here. Applejack's Rangers, Calamity spoke up. At Crossroads' query and look, Calamity explained, I know that ain't an official name, but seen as Steel Hoofs thought of y'all. Looking down at his hooves, he added, Should honor it. That's all I'm saying. The brown mare with a cropped yellow mane nodded. As I said, all the Applejack's rangers who would be able to attend the Elder's funeral are already here. There is no delay. It would be unseemly to allow his body to go unburied. I imagine there were, were internal matters to address as well. Steelers had been the leader and symbol that all these rangers had rallied to you with. With him gone, Crossroads had to act quickly to keep the rangers from falling apart. Every pony seemed to expect Crossroads to step up at the role of Elder. Many already acted as if she was, but I sensed there was an official protocol to be attended. And Crossroads was not willing to take those steps while Steelhooves remained unburied. Her love and respect for him were too much to allow that. Will you be able to attend? Wild manticores couldn't drag us away, Clamity said. I quickly offered a prayer to Luna Celestia's words. Oh, that Clamity's words didn't beg prophecy. I nodded. I couldn't travel any more tonight if I wanted to. I smiled grimly. I was having trouble standing. 
We'll stay the night, so long as that's alright with you. And you have a place Ditsy Duke can stay safely. Clemity smiled grimly. Your glowing friend? We can put her in one of the shielded rooms in maintenance, she explained. I'm not going to turn away some pony just because she's a ghoul. Especially not on the eve of Steelhoof's funeral. But I can't have her trotting in about the stable either. She is dangerous to those around her. I nodded. I knew Ditsy Do would understand. Where? Nope. That wasn't it. My legs decided that they were done with this standing thing. I wanted to try something else. How about falling over? Yep, that sounded good. Thump. Little Pip. Clemity reared, his voice full of worry. I... I'm fine, I told him quickly. Floor's nice. I think I'll stay here for a little while. Crossroads stepped forward. What's wrong with her? Little Pip was in Splendid Valley when the Mega Spell went off, Clemity told him worriedly. She keeps breaking all the rules and surviving the impossible, and I think reality is kicking her tail for it. I'll have our medics, Crossroads was saying. I'm getting velvet, Clemity swore, turning and flying out of the room. I sighed. All this fuss. I just need the rest a bit. Just a little nap. Gray clouds hung over the Equestria the next morning. The cold wind blew across the grass, bringing the scent of impending rain. Soft rumbles of thunder growled in the depths of the cloud curtain. Somewhere in the distance, the cracking booms of some sort of gunfire echoed across the landscape. We were gathered on the greens of the rolling hills near Stilhu's shack. The wind rippled the dark water of the lake. Behind us, Ditsy Doo stood near a single tall tree on the hilltop. She had draped a large black sheet over the, her lead coke, her glowing face and hooves shining out from under it. The ghoul Pegasus had somehow known to bring several such sheets. I sat in a wheelchair, just up the hill from the rows of armor-clad rangers that flanked both sides of the procession. I had been up for a little over an hour. I had passed out on the floor of the security center and slept all night in the stable clinic. The rest had done me a world of good, but I still felt terrible, an alien in my own body. And Velvet had watched me, hardly speaking a word the entire time, then insisted I intend the funeral off my hooves. Clemity had created black dresses for both Velvet Remedy and myself out of the additional sheets provided by Ditsy Doo again demonstrating his freaky knowledge of sewing. The cloth matched the color of my heart. I was drowning in sorrow, but I hadn't managed to cry. I felt like I was broken. The rangers on each side of the aisle stomped slowly in unison. The processional beat. Six rangers, in ceremonial barding, walked slowly down the clear side, their mouths holding the rods that held up the platform upon which Stilhu's body rested. I noticed that Strawberry Lemonade was one of the pallbearers. Tears were spilling from her eyes as she kept step with the larger stallions. Walking Steelhoofs to the ground next to the hole which he would be buried in and be his final resting place. Some pony that wielded Steelhoof's head had welded Steelhoof's head back on. Somehow, that always got me the most. My breath caught, then came out in shudders. My whole body began to tremble, racked with sobs. Velvet Remedy reached up a hoof and held me tightly. She had been crying softly since we left Stable 29, and most of the trip here yesterday. Now, she comforted me while the dam inside of me broke. My eyes burned fiercely. I still had no tears, but my whole body the other my eyes could not. Star Paladin Crossroads stepped forward as the pallbearers reached the pit. She began to say the words she had written the night before. Words spoken on Steelhoof's behalf. Applejack's Rangers, Crossroads began. That's what Elder Steelhoof's called us. My mind drifted 
as Crossroads spoke. I went back to when Steelhoos first began to travel with us. So, why are you still with us? I asked Steelhoos. Maybe I have nothing better to do. Lived through more than any of us could ever imagine, Crossroads was saying. He survived more than we could fathom. And through the centuries, his heart never strayed from his love and commitment to one single mare. I doubted him. He had kept his motivations, like his feelings, close to his chest. I remembered the pain that there was the first time I considered bucking him to the curb. I followed you because you were a better pony than I am, and you remind me of some pony else. You honestly strive to help and protect other ponies. I believe she would have approved of you. He said that when I'd called him into question. I haven't been faithful to my oath in a long time, but at your side, I can be again. Nothing more appropriate than to repeat the words he spoke to us all. Cross was reminded the Steel Rangers gathered before her, in the words of Steel Hooves, I call on you to stop and consider your oath. Consider where you are and what you are doing. Do your loyalties lie with Applejack, the mayor of the Ministry of Wartime Technology, the creator of the Steel Ranger armor, and the mayor who by her own hooves, the sweat of her brow, and the honesty of her heart forged the Steel Rangers? Another memory galloped, into, <coughs> galloped on the hooves of the last. Steelhoofs and I staring out over the harbor towards Friendship City. I need to thank you, little Pip. For what? I had asked. For failing. Steelhoofs had answered, surprising me. All this time, you have been some pony to look up to. You have made me want to be a better pony. But at the same time, you were too good. You were an impossible standard. Tonight, you have made it easier for me to live with myself. I curled up against Velvet Remedy, burying my face in her dress. Applejack was put in charge of the Ministry of Warned Technology because she was the bearer of one of the elements of Harmony, and the ruler of Equestria recognized the caliber of that. Do you think it was the virtue in her soul or the jewelry on her neck that made Applejack a bearer? The mayor who was soon to replace Steelhoofs, continued to speak his words with the reference they deserved. Today, you must choose with whom your oath lies. Another memory surfaced, filling me with fresh pain for my friend and for all he had lost. It's, be <clears throat> it's better that my child not know me. Steelhoofs had never, or had been, a haunted pony. The shadows of his past his sins and mistakes pressed down on him. I'm sorry, little Pip. I did everything I could to make them believe that taking Stable 2 was a mistake. I've been here for decades. But after you two showed up, and they realized there was still a functional stable down there, I've been so angry at him, even though he had tried his best. Part of me had wanted to kill him on the spot, he didn't resist, or fight back. Instead, he had stepped up, become the better pony he had wanted to be. Thank you, Steel Hooves, Zenith had said, for helping my daughter's village. I know it must be hard for an old soldier to help Zebrakin. Applejack would have wanted her rangers to protect all good ponies. Our people, not just ponies. He had struggled with his own prejudice, and was finally beginning to come to terms with that, too. He had taken steps on a path to recovery that he would now never be able to complete. I tried to remember the last thing I had heard him say. A warning, urging us to move. But the words themselves slipped from my memory. Instead, the actual words I clearly remembered, my friend speaking, were... The rest of you can go ahead if you wish, but Applejack would not want her rangers to ignore a cry for help. Carry on in his name and in his memory.
Crossroads said, concluding her eulogy. There was a pregnant silence, broken only by the wind, and the sounds of strange gunfire that continued in the distance, unabated. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Crossroads offered, the sadness soaking her voice. Before he lowered steel hooves into his final rest, I pulled myself from Velvet Remedy and focused my magic, rolling forward. She walked beside me as we made our way to the front. I turned towards the expectant heads of the Steel Rangers and opened my muzzle. But my voice caught in my throat. Another sob shuddered through me. I stared down. Again, Velvet put a steadier hoof on my shoulder. I... I swallowed heavily. I only knew apple snack for a short time, but, but I may have known him better than any pony. He shared things with me. M memories. I stopped. I couldn't continue. Instead, I left my pit buck confused leg. The remedy's horn began to glow. I. There's nothing I can say to do him justice. But as Apple Snack is lowered, I want to play this song. It was his and Applejack's song. I started the music. Velvet's magic amplified it beautifully. While I went to carry across the grassy hills, wafting over the pits of sand, and out across the lake like a breeze. I want to calm the storm, but the war is in your eyes. How can I shield you from the horror and the lies? When all that once held meaning is shattered, ruined, bleeding, and the whispers in the darkness tell me we won't survive. As the song played, the knight stepped forward, setting down the platform where Steel whose body rested. <laughs> in case still, in his Steel Ranger armor, adorned with the red trim and Applejack's cutie mark painted on the flank. The platform rested over the pit, the poles resting on the edges of the freshly dug earth. All things will end in time. This coming storm won't linger. Why should we live as if there is no more? So hold me beneath the cloud thunderclouds, my heart held in your hooves. Our love will keep the monsters from our door. The song was only marred by the rumble of distant thunder and the persistent sound of weapons fire. Strawberry Lemonade stepped away, her tear-reddened eyes meeting mine. Then she turned away, looking into the distance. I heard the sharp intake of air as Strawberry Lemonade gasped. I lifted my gaze in the direction she was staring. Far, far away, I could see the mountain range that ran through Equestria, the silhouette of Canterlot jutting out from the largest cliffside. Wrapped in a haze of pink that had been slowly bleeding away over the last few days, dark forms hovered around the city, sparking flashes of colored light. For I know tomorrow will be a better day. Yes, I believe tomorrow can be a better day. A few other rangers were turning to look, although most kept their faces reverently on steel hooves. Against the better judgment of my aching heart, I thought of my binoculars and turned them towards Canterlot. Enclave raptors, several of them, were firing on Canterlot ruins. No, I realized, as a spike of disbelief and dread lanced through me. They were firing under the city. Oh, goddesses, they couldn't. But even as I thought the words, the reinforced supports beneath the royal city gave way. The city above shifted, white towers cracking and breaking apart as the whole of Canterlot crashed down the mountainside. The rumble echoed all over the equestrian wasteland, almost indistinguishable against the rest of the distant thunder. A black pit swallowed my heart. Welcome back for her, I had promised. Until then, She's safe here. My last promise to Steelhooves.
And now, I would never be able to keep it. The Enclave are destroyed, the Canterlot ruins, casually killing every pony in Stable City. The wind came into my mane as I stood before the grave marker that one of the ranger's ponies had created. It was a beautiful, stately marker, fashioned from a large chunk of polished rose granite that had been scavenged from the Felloc Chamber of Commerce. Red and gray. Steelhoof's colors. Here rests Elder Steelhoof's Apple Snack, forefather of Applejack's Rangers. Steadfast, enduring, unwavering, and a true friend. Climity stood beside me. Velvet Remedy just behind. Zenith should be here, I noted mournfully. Yep, Climity agreed. She's here in spirit, Velvet Remedy reminded us. I looked down at the base of the gravestone, and the special holder that had been fashioned there. She ain't the only pony, Calamity said, following my gaze. In that special niche created, arrested, the orange statuette of the blonde, or statuette the blonde mane and tail, which I had told Crossroads that she would find in Steelhoof Shack. The words, be strong, were barely visible where the base was set into the granite. His little pony would watch over him forever. The spirit of Applejack would never leave his side.